So hello and welcome. Happy Saturday. Today is Saturday, July the 29th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 217. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So maybe some of you were wondering what happened to me yesterday. Well, more like what happened around here, big storms. Not only that, storms are still going on right now, and uh, they blew down a utility pole yesterday, just as I was about to do this. And so here we are on Saturday. See, that's how much I care. I want to make sure that you don't uh, lose a Q&A. And what's going on right now? It's 70 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is pretty darn good considering what's going on in the rest of the country. There's a major heat wave. The rain keeps coming. The wind is coming so strong. It's trying to get uh, the branches off of my trees, but the trees aren't having it. They're keeping their branches. 97% humidity. Stormy, rainy. Air quality, by the way, is really good, so... The fires, the smoke from Canada are being knocked down. I'm sure those particulates are getting slapped right out of the air by the heavy rain. So if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and uh, you'll see all the topics listed and they've been submitted over the past week. So here's a lot going on. We're in a minor dearth. We're in a tough period right now because the goldenrod is about to open. There is plenty of clover, but you know what? It's raining, so the bees are in high competition for nectar and pollen resources, and I think that's kind of reflected in a lot of the questions that I received over the past week, too. People are having curious things going on in their hives, and I think we'll touch on that. So if you want to know how you can submit your own question, please go to thewaytobe.org. Click on the page, mark the way to be. There's a form there. You can fill it out. So it's also a podcast through Podbean, the way to be. So you won't wreck your car while trying to watch a video. You can listen to it. And it's on a bunch of other carriers like our iHeartRadio and so on. So let's get right into the very first question, which comes from the YouTube channel. It's called HitMC6327. I believe my hive swarmed while I was on vacation. I came back to find very little brood, but I did find a queen. Although I watched for a bit, I never saw this queen laying, but hoped she was new and hadn't had a chance to begin laying much yet. And uh, I checked a week later and found zero brood, no eggs, no larvae, no capped brood. I also couldn't find the queen. I was able to pick up a new queen locally the same day and installed her. She came in a California cage with a candy plug. I installed it between the middle frames of the lower box of a two box, 10 frame Langstroth hive. One week later, I checked and still zero eggs, larvae, or capped brood and couldn't find the queen, although the cage was empty. Have any ideas about what happened? Am I too late to requeen at this point? There are still lots of bees in both boxes. Well, here's the thing. That's only two weeks, by the way. So I think some people, a lot of new beekeepers, it doesn't say how many years this person has been keeping bees, but uh, you get impatient and you can expect to see queens laying eggs and being in production, looking around just because you, but you spotted your queen so you know she's in there. That's a good sign. The other thing is remember what causes your bees to produce eggs. The queen doesn't go outside. How on earth does a queen know when it's time to produce more eggs and when it's time to draw back? This is related to the quality of the food and resources that the nurse bees that are part of her retinue, those are the bees that are always around her, always facing her, always cleaning her, removing her waste material, and they're providing nutrition. So the queen gets nutrition from the nurse bees, which get their nutrition from the foraging bees, which are providing it to the hive, and then they make bee bread and everything else necessary to produce their brood. So when those things are in decline or when they're light or when any part of that is missing, the most critical thing to make sure that your hives have, to make sure that your hives have, is honey. And if you don't have honey, then sugar syrup in a period of dearth. So a lot of people are having a very rough time. I can't imagine what's going on for those of you who are in the desert southwest or areas where you don't have rain and you have incredible heat. There's a heat wave that's in all kinds of weird places in this country this year. In fact, we had the hottest summer so far on record, period. So today, though, I can't complain. 70 degrees Fahrenheit? Yes, please. 
But if the resources aren't coming in and if the queen isn't sensing that there's plenty uh, to feed, then she will withhold her eggs or she'll cut way back on production. So watching your queen lay eggs and seeing her for 30 seconds or a minute or so and noticing that she's not producing an egg, that doesn't mean that she isn't laying some eggs somewhere in your hive. Uh, but of course she could back off. I would have waited a couple of weeks. Remember the magic number is three weeks. So if you go three weeks without any evidence of your queen being there or producing eggs, uh, then you might want to do something else, okay? Because we don't want those laying workers to start. So after all of your brood has emerged, in other words, all of your pupa have emerged from their cells and then there's no brood and no eggs or anything else, that's when they all of a sudden lack this pheromone that is always present when you have uh, bees in production. And when that's gone, your pheromone from your queen, as soon as that disappears, they know they're queenless pretty soon. And that's when the ovaries start to get activated. So by the time that third week rolls around, their ovaries either are suppressed by the presence of a queen with queen mandibular pheromone, or they are enhanced by the fact that the queen is absent and that's when laying workers begin to lay. It's not that at the third week they begin to develop their ovaries and activate their ovaries. They've been doing that slowly throughout that period and then they're actually producing eggs after the third week and then those are nothing but drones. That's what we want to avoid. But it is not rare to see a hive this time of year. And the beauty here is that I have observation hives so I can see what's going on. I have two hives doing what's being described right here. It took one of them more than two weeks before the resident queen started laying. And she's laying now. She started laying this past week. I have a third observation hive where they produce new queens, replacements after a swarm. And the queen is in there, but she has not yet begun to lay, but she's present. And the reason for that is what? We're in this dearth period. Now, normally, I don't get a big dearth where I live in northwestern Pennsylvania. There's lots of clover out there. But in the absence of rain, and then we get too much rain all of a sudden, but in the absence of rain, you have much reduced nectar flow. You also don't get a lot of uh, pollen. There is pollen coming from clover. And by the way, for those of you who are looking for this bright orange Cheeto colored pollen coming into your hive, if it's coming from clover, it could be tan or brown or almost gray looking. So often it's surprising to people when you point out the landing board of a hive and say, there went, there went some pollen, there went some pollen. They didn't see it because in their mind, they're looking for bright yellow pollen. Remember the pollen comes in a lot of different colors, but it's a reduced amount of pollen and therefore they're not really booming as far as brood goes. So you can artificially boost that. I don't recommend it if you're a backyard beekeeper and you just want to match up with what's going on in your environment. Although the climate right now, climatologists of course are different than um, your meteorologists that give you the weather report. And uh, they're pointing out kind of the extremes that we're having at unpredictable times. So I don't know what's going to go on, but your bees are going to have to be adaptable and the beekeeper will have to be vigilant. But I would not immediately requeen this colony. So to answer the question from hit MC, I would not uh, be swapping out another queen right away. The other thing that was absent from the question is uh, mentioned that it came in a California cage. For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, queen cages, when they come in, they usually have some workers with them. But uh, you can also get uh, queen cages that do not have workers with them. And the queen cages can be different sizes and shapes and things like that. But uh, when you put them in, and uh, just because the queen disappeared doesn't mean they accepted her. So one of the things I hope to learn from people when they say they tried to install a queen, what was the resident colony's behavior towards the queen when you were putting her in. Uh, since you pulled off the box and the way it was placed here down where the brood is, uh, I would expect to set that queen directly over the brood area and see what the bee's response is to her and make sure that they're trying to feed her, make sure that they're trying to take care of the queen and that you're not just getting one or two bees interested in that queen cage. I would expect to see that queen cage in a colony that is absent queen pheromone I would expect to see them all over the cage. In fact, you should have a hard time seeing the queen in the cage for all of the nurse bees that are on it trying to attend to the queen. And by that, I mean 
feeding her with their tongues. Some of them may be working on the candy plug that's at the end. And if they're not doubling over, trying to get their stingers in there, uh, then it's likely that they want that queen. But if you just have a couple passively kind of paying attention to her, that's not very good uh, validation that they need a queen. And that's because you may still have a virgin queen in your hive that's getting the attention. So you have a laying queen and her pheromone is strong. That's when they have a stronger response to an invading queen that's not of that stock because they don't need her. So that's when you would see a lot of stinging, biting of the screen and things like that. But uh, that's what I have to say. I think you jumped on it too soon. Give it some time. I would not buy another because here's what's been happening. For the last two weeks minimum, no eggs, no brood production. This means that the, the population of that colony has just been going downhill the entire time without replacements. So each time we do that, you have to think about if you got a new queen right now, how long would it take before adult bees are emerging from their cells from this new laying queen, assuming that you do not already have a queen in there and also assuming that they accept a new queen that you get shipped in or that you pick up. A local queen from a local breeder with a great reputation would probably be a good choice right now because again, remember the weather extremes? If you ship a queen and she sits in a UPS or a FedEx truck and it's 130, 120 degrees or even higher because some of them, some delivery people are not really aware of what's going on in that package that they're delivering and they'll set it right on the dash in the sun and uh, get cooked. And when, and the queen's not dead, but you can affect her fertility. Uh, so things that happen in transit, we don't always know what's going on. So this time of year, for me personally, if you could get a queen from somebody that's local without shipping her, then you might be able to salvage that colony. Uh, but there again, let's wait to see what's going on in there. Enough talk about that. Question number two comes from Greg. Kamano, Kamano, Kamano Island, Washington. Anyway, I'm a new beekeeper looking to expand and have a question. I see you have a video comparing a couple of plastic foundations, but would like to hear your thoughts on full plastic frames. They seem to be much cheaper than wooden frames with plastic foundations. Not to mention, you don't have to take the time and energy to assemble them. Curious to hear your thoughts and if you have addressed this already and I just missed it, I'm searching your channel. Okay, this is an easy one and something probably that we could talk about because a lot of people are supering right now and they're getting ready for that nectar flow and they might have questions about frames. So the opening, the thumbnail for today's picture, was two frames. First one is wooden frame. You put this together yourself, you buy the foundation. This particular foundation is by Acorn. I have two different types of foundations, so probably the video that was being referred to here is uh, Premier and Acorn side by side. So this is an all, this is an Acorn frame, heavy wax. That's why it's got this kind of dry powdery look to it. That's called the bloom, by the way, which forms on real beeswax over time. But this is what it looks like. The frame is plastic. The ends are plastic. This came from uh, an engineer that left Pierco, which used to be, you know, making plastic frames many years ago. And then Acorn was started. And now I think Acorn has changed hands again. But these are the ones that I bought originally and I put them in my observation hive and everything else for the reasons described. It comes in one unit and the other thing is this field through here, especially on the deep frames. When it came to Pierco, see how true this is? It doesn't bow at all. When it came to Pierco and I had a bunch of those and I got rid of them over time, uh, they would bow out or they would flex a little or the entire frame would be a little contorted over time. It would have a little twist to it. And I noticed that, I don't know if it's the plastic formula, I don't know if it's the design that Acorn came out with, but these stay true. So I will say this, if I'm getting a one piece, all plastic frame with, of course, you know, the foundation built into it, there are two companies. And I just thought of the other one right now, but I don't have one of their frames here. But uh, Cirocell makes a really good one. And Acorn makes this one a really good one. All one piece. 
So now what's the difference? And some people will say that, see these little edges here? If you have small hive beetles, that they could hide in there. So if you see that on the end going up, and of course across the top, which is less important, they're a little smaller, but down on the side, see how big that is? But uh, have I ever had small hive beetles hide in those? No, and that's because I don't have a lot of small hive beetles to begin with. But here's what I noticed on the ends here, they actually put honeycomb in there and they make cells right in the ends. The tops are too small for that. And then what do the bees do up there? They propolize them, they seal them right up. Propolis and beeswax, they fill them. So I'll tell you more in a second here. Here's the wooden frame. Now, one of the things that I like about the wooden frames lately is first of all, I put the frames together myself. So I glue them up and look, no hardware. I don't even put tacks in the bottom. I don't put tacks in the top. I glue these together with uh, Type Bond 3 and uh, I do a whole bunch of them at once and I've never had one come apart. So the wooden frames and you can buy them separate. Uh, I like them and I'll explain more about why other than the aesthetics, it just looks cool too. But look at the frame, see this hole right here? I cut a notch out. See the corners? I cut a notch out here. So I cut the corners off the tops cut a notch in the middle and I can do that because this comes as a piece already out of it. This is in here and it moves a little bit. What if I popped it out? This is the frame that you put together. It's got a groove in the bottom. It's got a groove on the top and of course you put your foundation in it. I consider the Acorn Foundation and the Premier Foundations to be performing equally. This is an Acorn. And one of the ways you can tell that is it has a smooth edge across the top. Acorn has that. If you look at Premier, this pattern, this hexacomb pattern follows right through the very top edge. But I cut this notch, cut the corners, easy to do. It comes perforated, by the way. I don't find that snapping off the corners at the perforation uh, works very well. So I just use 10 snips and I clip them off and then I install them in the frame. Uh, so here's the other thing. You can swap these out. You can pull these out of those frames. I've never had to, but you could. And then you power wash them when you want to clean them off, especially after they've been used for brood and stuff like that, and they get kind of tough. Because most of you, if you have deep frames, where are they located? They're down in your brood boxes. That's when they're the most useful. But here's another thing that occurs to me, and that's when we're harvesting honey. When the backyard beekeeper takes a big knife out and your cutting across the face of your frame. So the honey's all built out, the comb is built out, it's capped, and now you've got your uncapping knife, the hot one, whatever it is, and I prefer Pierce um, for their hot knife to cut it off. And as you're cutting it off, here's what I notice sometimes, if you're not careful, you'll actually shave a little bit of the plastic. And then you'll see a little black streak, a light streak of plastic on your honeycomb. Now that's something I really want to avoid. And so although I'm paying attention to that and I want to make sure that doesn't happen, the risk is there that when you're cutting across, you'll shave some plastic. The other thing is when we open up a hive and we're scraping off burr comb and we're cutting away the brace comb that builds up on top or on the bottom, again, you're taking your hive tool and you're scraping that down. Now, if your hive tool is really sharp, a lot of mine are because they just seem to work better when they're nice and sharp. That's another area that you have to be careful of going down the back that you're not shaving the plastic. Uh, we don't want to scrape off little bits and pieces of plastic that are small enough for your bees to actively chew. And we definitely don't want any of that to get into our beeswax or the honey. So that shifted me from this to the wooden frame. So, wooden frames, beeswax. If you scrape the wood a little bit, who cares? Scrape the wood a little bit across the top, who cares again? Secondary advantage. Most of my older frames like this are uh, an amber color now. In fact, the joints are fortified and sealed with what? Propolis. Propolis is a benefit to your beehive. The more of it that's in there, the better off your bees are going to be because now the propolis provides 
a protective environment disease-wise for your bees. So it really helps them out. So if we're using pine and uh, it's a little bit rough and so on, and the bees propolize it over the years, especially underneath and everything else, then again, the wood provides a benefit there. So which one will last longer? The plastic ones. Although if you take care of your hive equipment, and by the way, it, it falls into play here, the way that you pry your frames out of your hive when you're working on it. Someone uh, wrote to me when they saw the way I separate my bee frames, they thought that I should just be prying straight up. So where do we put this up for us? Most people take their hive tool, they hook it underneath the little ear here on the end, they pry it straight up. And how many times have you seen a beekeeper pull the top bar right out of the sidebar by prying it up because this was glued down and the upper portion of this glues to the adjacent frame with what? Propolis. This is why I always tell people, get in there with your hive tool and I put it between these shoulders right here is where I put my hive tool. I pry them apart and then I draw the frame sideways and then I lift it up. So I've already broken that contact here on the sides. So I've taken away the stress when I go to lift it from the back bar or the top bar of the frame. So now is that a problem with your plastic frames? No, those things hold up to everything. I even heat tested them. In fact, I put Man Lake, Acorn, and a bunch of other frames together in a hot box. It's a solar powered solar powered it's a solar wax melter so the power comes from the sun and uh, some of them bent uh, the man lake tabs on the ends actually flipped up so they had a much lower heat tolerance now is that realistic that's a destructive test now my background is non-destructive testing however i'm not beyond destructively testing things to find out what their limits are and which one had the greatest tolerance to the heat acorn so I'm get, if I'm getting a one piece, and I did not include uh, the Cirrusel frames in that test because I didn't have them yet. So they only came last year. Um, but so those are some of the advantages, disadvantages. Plastic will not absorb material. You're not going to see a lot of mold on it. Sometimes the older frames can have mold at the ends or the bottoms and things like that. So it's a balancing act. Uh, but for concerns about shaving plastics alone... Uh, I choose the wooden ones now, so I won't be buying any more uh, solid one-piece plastic frames. The only one that you have to buy that's all plastic if you're going to use them as part of your integrated pest management, for those of you who are treatment-free, these are drone frames. They have larger drone cells, and uh, this particular one comes from Acorn. I think whoever makes them, whatever company puts them out, I think they're always green. And that's so that you, the beekeeper, will always know drone brood. So they don't come as a separate foundation that you can put into a wooden frame. So these are the ones, if you use them, uh, you'll be putting those in your hive as a one piece frame. And for those, I recommend Acorn right now. Could change over time, but those are my thoughts. So I hope that's helpful. Question number three comes from Mustafa in Washington State, the city of Duval. Regarding feeding sugar syrup, dry sugar, there's a lot of feeder products on the market and majority of them come with the risk of leakage or bees drowning due to bad production design, user error, product defects, etc. during very cold freezing temperatures. We tend to switch to straight up dry sugar in lieu of syrup, which looks to me like a less messy, safer method. Why not switch to dry sugar feeding for the majority of the year with a close by water feeding station? Granted, they have the ability to fly out of the hive and bring in water. Thank you. Okay, so for Mustafa, why not feed dry sugar throughout the year? Um, because it's not as beneficial to the bees. It takes a lot. And first of all, we should talk about when and why and where we should be feeding the bees sugar at all. So right now, uh, if you're feeding inside the hive and you've got a colony that's struggling, one that you're not going to draw 
honey supers from, if you're not going to harvest the honey and use it for people and so on, then uh, you could have sugar on that hive to get it going. I don't feed even my nucleus hives, so they're kind of struggling right now. All of my bees are heightened in their sensitivity in their hunt for sugar. So if there were a hive that was open right now and you made a mistake and you cut open some honey supers in there, you're going to get mobbed by bees. So we're kind of in a robbing zone right now. But the golden rod is about to open and that's going to go away. So here's the thing. When are you feeding and why? I highly recommend not feeding your bees as a backyard beekeeper. If you're a commercial beekeeper, you have to. During periods of dearth, you don't want what we described earlier, which is if there's an absence of resources, if you don't have pollen and nectar coming in, then the brood would back off. If you're a commercial beekeeper, that's the opposite of what you want if you've got a nectar flow ahead. So they would be boosting their colonies to keep the brood up through the dearth until the nectar flow comes on and then they'll super those hives and they've got the population in those colonies to get those multiple stacks of honey on top. For the backyard beekeeper, my recommendation is always, unless they're starving, unless they're out of honey, I would not feed sugar syrup. Uh, now, here's the thing. There have been lots of lab tests done on what happens to your colony, what happens to a hive if they have no sugar syrup available. What's their longevity? What's their chance of surviving? So, and this is where if they have the unfortunate situation where they're brooding up at the same time, series of storms come through, they can't get out there and get the sugar syrup that they need or they can't get pollen that they need. Uh, they'll be using up the resources in the hive and because the population is growing, they use them up really fast. And this is where people that have scales, weight scales on their hives, uh, they will know then that a hive is losing weight at a rapid rate. And that's because they're brooding up and they need the resources. Remember that Brood uh, uses up your resources when it comes to bee bread, which is, of course, the pollen. But they're only using that until they're capped. So remember, when they enter the pupa state, their nutritional demand goes away. But the demand to continue to heat the brood remains. So the carbohydrate consumption is still there because look what happens. Uh, we have 70 degrees right now, which could feel hot and humid to a lot of people. But uh, remember that your bees are keeping their brood area with this covered pupa state. Uh, they are keeping that at 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit, which means if it's not that warm already in the hive, they have to warm it, even in summertime. So they need those resources. And if they consume all their honey resources and all their sugar reserves in the middle of summer, uh, they'll be desperate and they could die out within three days. I did a early this year uh, demonstration. I showed the video. Uh, the bees were coming out. They looked like they had been uh, into someone's pesticide, into an insecticide, because they were coming out of the landing board unable to fly and just bombing onto the ground. And uh, But then, thank goodness, it was an observation hive. So I could pull open the doors on the observation hive and see what's going on in there. And guess what they had done? Uh, because we were brooding up for spring and we had this weird weather shift, they couldn't get resources that they need. And so they had consumed all of their honey and they did it fast. So now I had a colony full of brood that needed to continue to warm their brood, right? And uh, they consumed all their resources. Now they're starving themselves to death to the point where even if all of a sudden the weather turned great, and there was nectar and there was pollen and everything that they needed out in the environment, they didn't have the energy to fly out and get it. So I put half a gallon of syrup on there, two quarts, right on top of that hive. And within hours, they were in full flight mode again, able to go out and forage. So it's kind of like you have to go out and get a job and your gas tank is running out in your car and you use up all the gas in your car. So now you can't go get the job to get the money to buy the gas to fill your tank again. So you needed some kind of reserve. Somebody had to bring gasoline to you to get your car loaded up again so you could go back out and join the workforce. It's kind of what was going on in that beehive. Only thing was they would actually die. So this is why we need to pay attention to the weight of our hives when we get these weird temperature extremes. And when strange things go on in the environment where normally there would be a pollen or a nectar resource that this year, for one reason or another, did not materialize. So we're going to have to be keen on how heavier hives are, whether or not they have the resources that they need, 
And I will say this, dry sugar, so let's abandon all that and say we've got a colony that we have to feed. Why not feed dry sugar summer and winter? And the reason for that is the dry sugar requires a lot of work for the bees to metabolize it. Now in the wintertime as an emergency resource, uh, they're going to metabolize it very slow because remember, the whole reason that that dry sugar is up there is not their primary resource. It is there as an emergency uh, carbohydrate for your bees. So it means they've used up all of their honey and their stored resources and now they're up there in the dry sugar and it means the difference between life and death for the bees. And you've got condensation forming inside the hive in the wintertime that they use to metabolize that. But uh, a lot of their energy is used just to get water to that surface if it's not already condensing. And uh, then you have to liquefy a solid and then you have to metabolize it because remember it's sucrose and it's going to be turned into fructose and glucose when they add their enzyme called invertase and then they create invert sugar. So all of this has to happen from a solid state. That's why it's an emergency fallback resource, not the primary. And so in the summertime when the weather's warm, I would not be putting dry sugar inside. I would be putting uh, liquid if you had to have it in there. The other thing is that you should know because some of you may be planning ahead for winter already. Uh, I no longer put dry sugar. My practice used to be a rapid round feeder, which looks like this. Used to put that on the inner cover and I put dry sugar in here, of course, and this is set for liquid. So part of the description is some of these feeders are badly designed. Your bees could get up in here, get down in around this ring and drown in the syrup. So this comes off in the wintertime, this becomes a dry feeder, and what keeps them from going out into your feeder shim is this clear cover that goes on the top and allows you to look in to see what the situation is. I don't use this anymore, and uh, I'll explain why. I have shifted years and years. Um, I've seen people talk about fondant. I didn't use it until it was convenient. See what I mean? So, and some people get mad. They say, are you peddling that uh, Hive Alive fondant again? I don't know if I'm peddling it, but uh, I'm describing to people that depend on me for their information, uh, what is going to get their bees through winter. And the hives that I put this fondant on, uh, because I don't make my own fondant, I'm not a chef, I don't do stuff. But the other thing is, uh, this has other things in it other than just the fondant. But you cut a tiny hole here. That's it, a little hole, and you put that opening directly over your feeder hole through your inner cover. So I've made a couple changes through the years. One is I make sure that that inner cover is an insulated inner cover. The next part is this fondant pack sits on it, and it conforms to that. So now the bees can't get up in here just because this pack is there in place. So this plastic keeps it in place. Then you've got a feeder shim. How big does the feeder shim have to be now? Just a couple inches. But if you're putting liquid feed on, my preferred feeder now has also changed through the years. I use these um, bee buffets. This one just happens to have a solid on it, which doesn't matter, but these now sit on top of my inner cover and they don't leak. The bees get up inside there. They have access to the syrup in this trough. So if I were starting a nuke right now, for example, or if I got some small swarm and I put them in a nuke box, I put the inner cover on. It has a hole that this sits directly over and I sit a second nuke box on top of that. And that becomes the housing for this. This cover stays in place. And what's interesting about that is when I take the jar off, the bees cannot get out in this reservoir. So the bee drowning aspect is taken away too. So if I'm feeding syrup in the summertime, this is what I'm putting on a hive, inside the hive. And that's because I only want to be feeding the colony that is weak or that needs the support or that needs to get kick-started. And in the summertime, I'm feeding one-to-one -one sugar syrup, the very light sugar syrup. So that's what I'm doing. That's called a bee buffet. 
And for the winter time for that emergency feeding and that emergency resource, I'm using Hive Alive. And that name proved out to be true last winter. So survivability last winter was fantastic and the bees were consuming that. Some of my viewers that were using the Hive Alive were a little concerned because the bees seemed to bypass their stored honey and were up in the Hive Alive too early. And to that I say, who cares? Because that means if they're getting the Hive Alive too early, what's held in reserve? The capped honey that they have in the hive. So if they use up one before the other, it doesn't matter. What's really critical is that they don't run completely out of both. And here's the advantage. If you have a fondant pack like that, you pull the outer cover on one of those intermediate warm days in the wintertime, and without opening it up and exposing the bees and without all their warm air escaping and everything else, you can look right down through the back of this pack and you'll see how much of it they've consumed. And then you put that in your notes. Yeah, they're 30% consumed, they're 50% consumed. And then if you luck out and get one of those 60 degree days or the mid 50s when the sun is warm and shiny uh, and shining down in your hives, that's when you could come out with a replacement pack, pull that one, put the other one on and you're back in business. So those are the two feeders that I now recommend um, for feeding specific hives. One for winter and I don't, again, I'm not doing dry sugar anymore. It doesn't mean you can't. I'm just saying that the dry sugar was profoundly outperformed by Hive Alive Fondant. That's all I'm saying. And uh, this feeder, no drowning, and the Hive Alive, no drowning. So, next, question number four comes from Wayne from uh, New Brunswick, Canada. I'm a 66 year old first time beekeeper. I have a mentor who set me up with a nuke and a hatching virgin queen. All is well, she is laying nicely and now I have eggs, capped brood and larvae of all sizes. I expect the first workers to hatch August 1st to the 3rd. Now there's something I wanna point out. I'm not picking on the person that submitted the question, but uh, if we're learning terminology in beekeeping, what hatches is an egg. What emerges is the pupa after it's finished pupating. It emerges from its cell as an adult bee. So that's the distinction. Eggs hatch, cells they emerge from. So the same thing with queens. So when they lay an egg in a queen cell, uh, she hatches from her egg on the third day, end of the third day, and then she will emerge from the queen cell. So just a little lesson on that. Here in my location, we have had 18... 0.7 inches of rain from June 1st to July 23rd. This is likely close to a record that mirrors 2021. Along with this rain, we have had an incredible amount of heavy ground soaking fog. I have two hives in the yard, one mine and one owned by my mentor who is away on holiday. The bees have been bringing in very little pollen. This is supported by my observation watching the hives with my binoculars. I only see one to two bees minimum with pollen. Inspecting the frames in my hive, I see bee bread to be depleted. Okay, so that's on the 24th of July. Friday, I added a global 15% pollen patty at the top of my second box. Both my mentor and I use medium boxes exclusively. The bees are flying very well and seem to have full bellies of nectar when they arrive on the landing board. So it says here, did I do the right thing by adding the pollen patty? So once again, um, this is getting sketchy because what we would normally say is, is keep bees that are locally adapted and kind of mirror environmental cues. In other words, these bees can handle themselves in the environment. So that's the weather extremes that you have, but also this annual cycle of nectar and pollen and plants that are providing those resources. So what's weird now is like we've got all this rain. So what did the rain do? Rain does a couple of things. One, it dilutes the nectar. So it makes the sugar content much lower depending on the plant. The other thing is bees are collecting pollen. When they collect pollen, if the pollen's damp, they don't collect it. This is why bees rarely go out to collect pollen early in the morning when there's a whole bunch of humidity on the ground. So one of the mentions here is that we have heavy fog that actually soaks the ground. We have that here where I live. You go out early in the morning and uh, 
you everything looks wet as if it rained even if it did not rain the night before and that's just because it's condensing onto the dew point is existing on the grass and foliage and everything's getting soaked that's why your bees because they're conserving their energy they usually don't fly out until later and right now you know we have storms and stuff outside so the bees normally would be foraging but they can't because it's windy and rainy and the pollen is not accessible to them usable pollen is not accessible because think about how your bees uh, collect the pollen. They need it to be able to float freely. They need the pollen to come off of those anthers onto their hairs. And then they need to be able to groom them back. And it's the bees that make the pollen sticky with the nectar that they've brought with them. and Or the nectar they're getting from the plant itself. If the flower provides both nectar and pollen. And some flowers don't. They may provide only pollen. Or they may provide only nectar. Like milkweeds, for example. They only get nectar from that. And then we have ragweed, for example, that they will only get pollen from. So depending on what's going on, they have to dampen the pollen themselves, but it's with a carbohydrate source, with uh, something that's sweet. And that's why even the pollen balls that are on their hind legs has already, become to fer has already began to ferment. And that's because they've already amended that with a sweetener. And so then that gets further processed after they bring it back to the hive and put it in. So the good news that I see here is Wayne is seeing some pollen coming in. And that's a good sign. So the rule of thumb generally is when there's plenty going on out in the environment, if you see 10 or more per minute, you're in brood production. That means open brood, consuming resources, and you're providing replacements for that. So um, given that you've got a lot of rain, I think that as things dry out, I'm hopeful that we're about to go into August. So this is my last Q&A for July, and uh, August is going to be for us, you know, I expect to be a big nectar time and, of course, honey production. So uh, putting on your pollen patty, what's going to tell the story there? And I have a new favorite pollen patty, by the way, and it's also made by Global. Global has been tested very well. Randy Oliver at Scientific Beekeeping did a bunch of pollen tests and saw which ones brooded up the strongest. Global is contracted by Hive Alive, so the same people that make this fondant also make a pollen patty, which I'm testing right now. And what am I testing it on? Nucleus hives. So tiny hives, five frame nukes uh, that are double deckers, five over fives. And we're going to see side by side, same environment, same exposure. And we're going to see if one of them broods up more simply because they have a constant resource in the form of a pollen patty. Now, do they need it? For me, no. They don't need it. It's just uh, something I'm doing to see because I like to do backyard testing and I want to see if it significantly boosts brood production in the one that gets the Hive Alive pollen patty. And pollen patties are different than just patties, right? There are winter patties that you might be looking at and they are free from pollen. So having pollen present in the patty and the pollen comes from California. That's all I know. But uh, so one will brood up faster than the other. So do you need it? No, but if you put it on and they don't consume it, they have what they need. If you put it on and they consume it like crazy, then they needed it and they want it and there will be brood production. Uh, remember also that outside cues have a lot to do with what's going on with brood production as well. But uh, I expect that if they're desperate and if they're brooding up and you put pollen patties on and they have plenty of nectar resources out there that you will see them consuming those patties and you should see a boost in your brood. So that's the end of question number four. On to question number five from Tony from Union, Washington. My question is, I have 20 frame layens hive that is almost full of brood and honey. The entrance is in the middle with options for an entrance at either end. So in this Wait, I have a model, which just occurred to me. This is a layens hive. Well, a model. This is a small one. These are the entrances we're talking about. They come with three of them. I purchased mine from Dr. Leo Sharashkin. And uh, so it says here, how do I move the entrance from the center to the end? Do I move the frames just open the entrance, or is it too late to change the entrance? So for me right here, right now, my hives, uh, a lot of them are brooding up and uh, 
we can see what's going on there. These nucleus hives that I have, they are laying eggs at a rapid rate. Every 11 seconds, I believe one of them was doing. So anyway, these have different settings. So they have wide open. They have the queen excluder, which is those three little slats. They have vented and they have closed. So with mine, okay, if this is facing south, so this is the south wall, this is the east wall. Mine are open here on the end only. These are all in the closed position. Now what's being described is the brood is here in the middle. This is open, which makes it difficult to predict where they're going to store their honey supers. So what I do, that's why I do the entrance at one end, because now the first five or six frames on the Layens hive is nothing but um, brood and then mixed with pollen and some nectar stored and of course finished honey. All that is convenient to the brood so that they can have those resources ready and immediate. And then for mine, as you progress down the length of this, these are nothing but capped honey and no brood. So it makes it very easy because I don't use queen excluders. So it makes it very easy to figure out where your honey's gonna be. And then I start at this end when I'm doing an inspection and I work my way this way until I get to brood. So then I go back and I start removing frames of honey and then replacing them with drawn comb so that they can continue to produce and store honey without being honey bound. And that's why I had to buy another Lands Hive because my first one filled up too fast. So what could you do? Is it too late to just say, let's close this one, let's open this one, and then let them migrate this way? I think it is because if these frames already have honey filling them on either side of this entrance, then um, it's unrealistic to think that during an upcoming nectar flow, that they're gonna consume away this honey. So one of the things you could do, if you shifted and opened it here, I'm gonna give you a couple of options. One is leave everything the way it is, have your brood through the center, close that entrance, open this entrance, but harvest all of the honey on this side and then restore these frames as open cells. That's one. That gives them space for your queen to come over here because here's the entrance. Now she'll start laying in this vicinity and they'll eventually migrate this way. Do you have enough time where you live in Washington state? I don't know. So um, if you don't have a lot of brood time ahead of you, now I would suggest pulling all the honey frames out. Everything that's got brood on it, keep them in the order that they're in and migrate them all to this end and then backfill with the frames you just pulled. And leave a couple partially filled honey frames right adjacent to the brood there, and they will be backfilling that with nectar and resources. So those are the two options. If you have a lot of time, pull these frames, extract them, get the honey, put it back, assuming you have a nectar flow ahead, and then uh, they will gradually migrate this way. For me here, we're kind of at the tipping point for that to happen. So now what would I do personally? I would pull these frames, move all the brood over, put those frames back here, and then close this entrance, open this entrance, and they'll figure it out. So just my suggestion. I don't know that you can really mess that up, but uh, those are just things to think about. And I uh, hope that works. And let us know what you do, please. And uh, let us know how it works. We wish Tony the best with that. Question number six comes from Doug. In a Kennebunk, Maine. Hmm. So it says, I would like to know your thoughts on the Apame hive. Now that you've had it for a year, I'm experimenting with three Apame hives, three Lysen 10 frame hives, and three Lysen 8 and 9 frame hives to see if the bees winter over better here in Maine. I also have 11 wooden hives that I'm keeping. Last winter was brutal. With exceptionally warm days followed by cold nights when the sun set. I lost half my hives over winter. Been a beekeeper or helping my father keep bees for half a century now. And have kept between 8 to 25 hives during that time. And I'm always trying to learn new skills as we face new challenges with the bees. 
Okay, so for Doug, the Apame hives. Here's what I think of them. Um, I like the way they're made. And uh, now that I've been through my first winter with it, I'm gonna do some small mods. The entrances that are coming out, the new ones, will be out at the end of the summer. And uh, because that's the other thing, when you look at the entrances on the Apame hives, they have those little arches in them because they're built in mouse guards and everything else. Uh, I want those little arches out so that in the winter time, I'll be able to scrape out my dead bees. So the Apame, I would say, uh, what holds me back is the price. Like with anything, I have to make judgments on what I'm gonna buy and what I'm gonna have here. And the thing is, I have lots of beehives. So I don't need to buy anything right now. Um, and they have made changes. I just received the new Apame top feeder that's got that central core. So things like um, fondant could go right into that thing. And then of course the bees come up from underneath and feed, but they can't access that upper space. That's cool. I like that Apame is making changes as they go. In other words, uh, when BP, beekeepers give good feedback and make suggestions for what they would like to see, uh, they're very approachable and they are making changes to the hive, but that hive is bulletproof so far. When these storms come through, when we get this heavy weather, like we've just had, and just imagine this happening in the winter time, uh, the Apame hives, I don't worry about. Now, last winter, of course, they were new to those hives and they had not sealed up everything. So they were venting through the top. I lost two out of 22 colonies last winter and uh, both of those were Apames. That doesn't mean that it was the hive design that caused them uh, to fail. For example, uh, they were small colonies and they were late in the year because I did not have it throughout the summer. So they didn't, they didn't have the summer to customize the hive themselves and seal up all those little vents. This year they are. So there's little vents in the feeders that insert and there's little vents in the little cup that controls whether you're giving them access to dry feed or to liquid feed and so on. And so the top was permanently vented. So it had these slats on the ends. And so now after talking with the people at Apame, I'm just gonna put little pieces of double bubble up in there and I'm gonna seal those vents because they're out of reach of the bees. The bees cannot close that off themselves. And we as the hive owner, manager, we don't have the option to close it off either. So uh, rather than make a configuration change, the guy just recommended that we put a thin layer of some material in there that prevents the airflow through the top of the hive. And that way, those who want venting through the top for their bees uh, can leave those open. So that made perfect sense. It's just an air barrier. We just want to stop the airflow. Um, so that was one thing that I wanted to change. The entrances are going to be changed. The other thing is you can just take the entrances off if you don't like the entrance reducers. And I also have the seven frame queen rearing uh, hive. They all come. One of the big advantages that I really like about them too is I used to just put my swarms in 10 frame hives and let them fill them out. Then I changed the nucleus hives, which were five frames, and I uh, had much better results with a five frame deep nucleus box, and then just stacking them as they went. With the, um, so here's kind of, if you're number crunching on what they cost, the Apame uh, is still a little expensive, even if we're thinking of two separate nucleus hives, because if we have a single 10 deep frame box, it has a divider that goes into it. And that divider is thin enough that I can still put five frames on either side. And then when you put the super on, the super can be deep. And you can put a split, a divider that comes with it that matches the divider on the bottom brood box. And so now we have a five over five, just like two nucleus hives, but now they're together in one hive. So that's very convenient. And the feeder on top of that configuration is divided so we can feed or not feed, feed or not feed either side, depending on what they need. So you talk about an opportunity to make comparisons side by side. I don't know how much drift is going on there because the entrances are so close. Are they crisscrossing and just going to each side as they want to? I don't know, but that's something I definitely like about it. And uh, the other thing is, I don't know what it's like up there in Maine. If you have heavy winters and insulated hive, you're also including here that you're using lysin hives. Those are polystyrene hives with a big R factor. So 
Um, it sounds like insulated is where you're headed. I found that uh, if I insulate just the inner cover on my hives, and the reason I'm saying this is a lot of people listening right now might be thinking of investing and configuring, thinking towards winter. So most of my hives are the standard three quarter inch pine sidewalls and they have the insulated inner covers and then fondant on that insulated outer cover above that. So the dew point is never achieved directly above the cluster. Therefore, moisture never drips directly down on the bees, but moisture does develop on the inside side walls of the hive and the bees are using that water uh, to survive winter. So for the reasons that we talked about earlier, if they need to metabolize any kind of semi-solid sugar source, even fondant or dry sugar, then they need water to do it. They also need water, period. If you're surviving winter as a human, you need a lot of water. Staying hydrated is just as important for winter survival as it is for summer. So same thing for our bees. Now, so I've found out that I don't need insulation on the sidewalls of my hives because I don't know what I would do with the bees uh, coming out of winter if they were more robust than they were just even this last year. So um, that's why I did these incremental changes so I could find the point at which my bees do the best. And there are reasons why um, the Apame hives that are insulated were flying and foraging later. So almost too late in the day when these early spring opportunities opened up and we had things like pussy willows in the wetlands and stuff like that. My uninsulated hives, with the exception of the insulated inner cover, as soon as they're facing south, so they get warmed on the face right away, the face of the hive, and they were flying out by 12 noon or 1 in the afternoon, and they were getting resources and making it back. Meanwhile, the apame hives, the bees that were in there, were not getting out until 3.30, quarter till 4. And uh, then, of course, this is where... You know, it gets kind of wonky because, well, if they're more insulated, they use less resources. Well, ultimately, they died, so they didn't do anything eventually. And they did use up their resources inside the hive, but remember, they were vented through the top as well. And they were fed, so they were given dry sugar. We could not put these uh, fondant packs on there because the way the hive was configured, there was no place to put them. That's the good news. That's what will change coming up this winter is the new hive cover has that center reservoir and now fondant can be put in it and it's designed to feed solids like that. And the bees can go up right underneath and access the fondant and we can see from the top again without opening everything, we can see what the rate of and level of consumption is. And because, I'm gonna do a video about this I think, but because there's an insert, a food grade plastic insert that turns upside down and sticks in there, you could take all the fondant out of this pack because the purpose of the pack is to keep it from drying out too soon and becoming brittle uh, and then not usable to your bees. So if we cut it out of the pack and then we jam it all into this little plastic container, which is like a piece of Tupperware, then that sticks in there now uh, it is protected from drying out still because we shifted it to another container that seals it all up. So I'm just letting you know ahead of time, that's how I'm going to test it this coming winter. I'm going to cut out these uh, Hive Alive fondant packs, which I've already stockpiled, and I'm going to uh, fill them in the Apame solid feeder packs. And uh, yeah, these expire July of 2024, so I'm good to go. On that so for the Lyson hive it's going to facilitate uh, better management for me I just can't afford to buy a bunch of them so I think I have four and uh, yeah, I've got four Lyson hives out there I really like the seven frame queen rearer which I don't use for queen rearing but it's got you know double openings in the front because it's got the divider double openings in the back so if you're doing uh, queen rearing then of course one hive on one side would have the entrance this way, the other hive on the other side would have the entrance to the back to cut down on that confusion. And in the second box, same thing. All these options are open and they're color-coded and everything. I think it's very well thought out. 
and I wouldn't mind having a bunch of them, but they are expensive. Can't do it. So I have what I need right now, and then maybe I'll sell off the honey and use the proceeds from that to uh, buy more of them. I don't know. So every hive design has its strengths. Every hive design uh, has its drawbacks. And uh, the Appa May has more strengths and drawbacks right now. It's looking good. So I'm happy to have them, happy to use them. Oh, that was my last question for the day. So now we're in the fluff section. I wanted to talk about uh, the survey that we did, uh, which was really interesting because early in the year, and by the way, it still holds. I found one Varroa destructor mite in one of my observation hives. So what I did is we posted a survey and some people wrote and said, how do I access the survey? So you go to the YouTube channel, which is titled Frederick Dunn. And uh, you go to the social platform part and then there's a survey there. So the survey was twofold. One is how do you count your mites? And the seventh was, um, Mite levels, are you seeing if you test for mites? So we didn't have a lot of respondents, but 280 votes for how do you count mites? So let's go over that. Uh, hands down, 45% of the respondents said that they use the alcohol wash to count their mites. So they kill their bees, they shake them out, and they swirl it, and they get the uh, bees to separate from the uh, varroa destructor mites, and they count them. So the next runner up from that was the Dawn Ultra Dish Soap. That's my preferred method. So if you want to Google it, it's called Dawn Ultra Pure Essentials. And some people go, wouldn't any Dawn Ultra work? And I say, sure it would, but the Pure Essentials, biodegradable. I have a well, you know, so it's an environmental thing for where I live uh, because we have a septic system. Everything eventually ends up in our groundwater. So. Uh, the Dawn Ultra, so 21% of the people did that. We were tied with 17% uh, uh, using the sugar shake or sugar rolls. And 17% uh, uh, simply looked at their bees for mites. That's a very tough way to go. So the other part of the survey was, how many people are seeing more mites, less mites, just the same? This was really interesting, 229 votes. So, and these are for the people that are testing mites, okay? So I'm seeing low mite counts this year. 42% 40 of the respondents said they have lower mite counts this year than they've had in the past. So I'm seeing normal mite counts, that's 22%. I'm seeing higher mite counts. Uh, so that's 6% of the people. And then here's a surprising one for me. 30% of beekeepers that responded to the survey do not count for mites at all. And to those people, I want to say, be very careful because you can have a very good first year. You can set up your bees, you're a brand new beekeeper, everything goes great. Wow, out of the blue, you get all this honey. Everything is looking fantastic. You come through winter okay. Year two, everything is great. Your bees are doing fantastic. I don't count mites. I'm a holistic beekeeper, whatever you want to say or do. Uh, but you're not counting mites, so you don't know which of your colonies are doing really well and which are not, so to speak. It's the third year that's the charm because here's what happens. Uh, the mite production builds up over time. The uh, diseases that your mites carry are vectored through the years. Not only that, the colonies that you have that have the varroa destructor mites on them and the diseases that they're carrying, they are being spread to other beehives in your vicinity, in some cases a mile or more away. And so for those of you who do not count mites and do not understand what your mite loading possibly is, you are not only uh, risking your own hives when you do that, you are risking the colonies of your neighbors. So if there's other hives around and up to 20% of those colonies could be from drift from other colonies. And so you're going to spread potentially those diseases. So even if you're treatment free, I'm nothing against that, but treatment free is not hands off. Treatment free means integrated pest management and knowing what your bees are dealing with. 
So I highly recommend that for those of you who are not counting mites and not figuring out how to determine what your mite loads are, I really hope that you'll find a method that you approve of. I did not list the CO2 method here. So if you're 100% against killing off your bees to count for mites, then the CO2 method just knocks them out and you can visually look on the body of the bee with magnification to see if they're carrying mites. And then you'll get an idea of what's going on. And if you choose not to treat, that's up to you. Um, but you do risk not only losing your own colonies, but having a profoundly negative impact on other colonies in your area. So you can be treatment free and uh, still have some responsibility for the potential for your colonies to have disease. And if they do, you should, in my opinion, that's why you're here, it's just to hear what my thoughts or opinions are. And uh, so my opinion about that is if you have a colony and you wanna be treatment free and you do not uh, want to spread any diseases to others, if they're in decline, then you should call the colony, just as you would any sick organism to prevent that from spreading to others because these studies have been well established that a perfectly healthy apiary that's full of hives that are doing extremely well can have one colony that becomes a mite farm and that produces a whole bunch of mites. And we know that then there's a domino effect where colonies that otherwise would have been completely fine would have made it in the presence of a colony that had high mite loads because it's not just the mites, it's the diseases that they carry. Um, that one colony cascaded through all the others and so took out colonies that were otherwise mite tolerant, mite resistant. Those are two different things. And because some bees are demonstrating that they have the ability to exist and live even with minor mite loads. So in other words, with some mites present, but if you don't know, if you're not counting them, if you're not keeping records, you have no idea which colonies are doing what and why. If you happen to have a colony of bees that chews mites apart and does fantastic things and looks like they have genetics you'd like to work with, then those are colonies that you would split from. But if you don't count mites, you don't know. So, I've uh, been on my soapbox long enough on that one, but I just want to let you know, there's lots of ways to go, but that's concerning. And even when I am giving a presentation, I ask people how many of you count mites or how many of you do mite washes and people that are completely unfamiliar with that concept at all. It's very interesting to me because we don't know if we have great colonies. I have one colony out of 33 that required treatment this year. One. If I didn't treat it, if I was going to let it raise mites, I would have to get rid of it to preserve uh, the mite kind of the low mite and mite free status of a lot of my other colonies. So it took 17 years to get them this far along. I would really hate for somebody to show up and send a mite farm my way and overwhelm an otherwise surviving colony of bees. So anyway, these are this is the fluff for today. So this is your plan of the week. And I realize that this applies mostly to the Northeastern United States because that's where I am. But uh, goldenrod right now, go out and take a walk in the woods. It's the weekend. Check things out. See what's blooming. See what your bees are on. Listen, by the way, when the wind's not blowing crazy like it is right now here, and when it's really calm just before, you know, late afternoon, mid-afternoon, and you start hearing it sounds like a swarm, you'll find your bees all over clover or something. You'll find your bees all over goldenrod. Right now they're doing the raspberries too. So we have a raspberry bumper crop. Elderberries have honeybees all over them. In fact, the elderberries sounded like a swarm of bees. That's how many of them were working them. So goldenrod, kind of like in the spring when the dandelions bloom, and that kind of is an indicator when you start to see yellow meadows of dandelions, get ready because your nectar flow is on. Same thing here for goldenrod. We have asters, they're in bloom. Uh, we have hyssop and uh, the giant hyssop is in bloom and it's being visited by a wide range of pollinators. And so that's doing fantastic. And as I mentioned before, I really want to expand my hyssop zones, my hyssop areas, but uh, be ready to super. And I'm gonna give you options for that too, right? So 
you've already got a hive that's got three boxes on it and you don't want to put four or five boxes on because you don't want to lift them. You have an option. So be ready with frames, uh, whichever ones, the wooden frames, the plastics, whatever you have, mediums, shallows, whatever you're working with. Here's what I recommend. Before your top box, which should be the surplus for you, not what the bees need for wintertime, but when you do your inspections in the coming weeks when the goldenrod opens up and starts to kick off this nectar flow that we've got ahead of us, um, take your hive butler totes or whatever tote you have that will allow you to pull a frame and get it away from your bees. Uh, you go and inspect the top boxes and then you'll see that seven out of eight, eight out of 10 frames will be fully capped with honey right now. So I would encourage you, if you don't want to super the hives, to pull every other frame and then push the semi-full frames to the center if you want to, and then add new frames outboard of that. So now we'll be taking partially filled frames that are in the number one and number 10 spot, or the number one and number eight spot if you've got the eight frame boxes. And if the ones through the center are completely capped, you can push those to the outside and push the partially filled ones right in the center because they'll be built up first. Or you can checkerboard and pull every other frame for harvesting. And I hope you've already got drawn comb to take its place. So you should be coming out with replacement frames at the time you pull the capped honey frames, put them right in there on top. This will take very little smoking, if at all, and that's so that you can get those frames out and you can start doing your honey harvest bit by bit like that. So I don't care if you pull a garden cart or if you want to take uh, somebody else mentioned, this is not my idea, but something that I saw in the comments. Um, somebody mentioned getting a big tote and uh, just like you get from Home Depot, Walmart, wherever you go, put that tote on a wagon and then they put uh, deep empty boxes inside the tote and that was their rack for storing and transporting and then they just put the lid on it. So shake all the bees off, put it on the tote, put the lid on. So that was a nice um, addition of something that you might do. So I use Hive Butler totes for my own because they leave room between them which allows for some of the wonky comb and stuff that we might get. And uh, so you can pull every other frame. That's my plan. And of course, for me, the flow hives, as they max out, will be, of course, draining off uh, from the frames on those directly into the charts while we're out in the bee yard. But we're going to keep ahead of the nectar flow this year, and I'm not going to super up a bunch of boxes. And one of the advantages of that is when we get to the end of the summer, we have to pack down the hives for winter. If you've got five boxes on and you have to get the bees out of all those boxes to pack them down, then sometimes you have a challenge on your hands. And because we want to leave the top box full of honey, for me, that's a deep brood box and that's a medium super that's full of honey. And then on that goes the insulated inner cover and then the outer cover, which is uh, also on a feeder shim box. And then that's the winter configuration. So by harvesting like that, we're not adding more and more boxes, which there again, at the end of the year, you'll just put a, a skateboard underneath your top super, get the bees out of it. This is when you get to the end of the year and then you pull that off and then you just put your lid on and now you've got your deep and your full honey super to get them through winter. Now, if your full honey super is not full, so for example, it's a 10 frame medium box, but the first couple of frames on one end and the frames on the other end are not fully drawn capped honeycomb, then I highly recommend that when you're harvesting your honey from your other supers, that you hold back full combs. And as you go into winter, you swap out those partially filled ones with full ones, and then you just harvest the partially full ones at the end of the year. But you wanna leave with maximum resources going into winter for your bees, and then the emergency resources on top of that. I'm telling you that now so it doesn't catch you off guard. I know that we're just going into August, but things happen fast. So uh, for those of you who are treating your Varroa that have high Varroa mite counts and things like that, if you haven't done it already, this is your sweet spot for treating for your Varroa, especially those who are using oxalic acid vaporization and things like that. It is most effective when there's the smallest amount of brood. So a lot of people that wrote in today that are having zero brood, no brood, low brood, and if they're not counting their mites, if they have that low brood or no brood situation or everything is open, and they find that they also have mites, 
It's a sweet spot for giving a treatment with oxalic acid vaporization, which is an organic treatment that you'll get over 90% efficacy when you treat when it's all open brood. So that's an opportunity for those of you who are waiting for those queens to come into lay. And it does not damage the queens when you dose it right. So the other thing is we had a lot of fun out at Presque Isle, which is on our Erie coast here in the Erie County, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was there to give a presentation, but what we did, and the reason I'm telling you this is it's fun ways to engage children and uh, teach them about bees. So I brought an observation hive with me. One of the little ones, it's a five frame observation hive and I got it from Daydont. And uh, we pulled one frame up that had all the brood on it with the queen on it and we did not mark the queen. Often when people bring bees for educational purposes, they like to make sure the queen's thorax is marked so everybody can see that really easily. And I think uh, we're kind of ripping them off when we do that. I say don't mark the queen. And the beauty of this was the queen in this box was new. She was young. She's laying. And because these are swarms. So often what goes in a nuke box for me is a late season swarm or a swarm that's really small. So I suspect that it's a virgin queen when I put them in a five frame nuke and they haven't even filled that out yet. So this is a young queen, she's in lay, and it was even better because she's dark brown and black banded. So she looks a lot like all the other bees in there. She was very small, but the good thing was she was laying an egg, and we had someone that counted them uh, every 11 seconds she was laying an egg. But so what we did is kids 12 and under, this is a great activity, if you're 12 and under and you spot the queen, you're going to get a little bee. So if you look back here, Underneath my on-air sign, that little fuzzy bee, we had a bunch of those. And uh, we were giving them away as prizes for kids 12 and under when they spotted this unmarked queen because she's going to be on that frame. It was a lot of fun. We had 74 visitors. We gave out those bees to the kids that spotted them. And it was remarkable. We had photos there on the table that showed them what the queen would look like that the retinue of the bees would be facing the queen, they'd be watching her, and those kids got to see her laying eggs and everything else. So we really don't need to mark the queen for people to see her. So that was really good, it worked fantastic. Uh, the other thing is, this is your opportunity, we're getting late in the year, your chances of starting another colony from scratch and getting them going. Uh, some people reported today that they're having troubles finding their queen and they may in fact be queenless. It's time to start looking at your other colonies for possibly combining these queenless colonies with queen right colonies. Because you're running out of time. The other thing is start to look at your entrances, uh, entrance reducers and things like that because guess what else is gonna happen as the summer draws to an end and we get into August and September. Expect the numbers of yellow jacket wasps to be on the rise so we're going to have to start paying attention to those numbers and uh, make sure our entrances can handle them. So that's pretty much it. And uh, let's see, yesterday we did a, an interview with Corey Stevens that posted yesterday and also a video posted yesterday on how I'm handling my aphids over here with, uh, with the uh, ladybugs there. So lady beetles, depending on what part of the world you're in, but I released a bunch of lady beetles on the goldenrod because I have a field of goldenrod and there were aphids on so many of them, it was kind of alarming. And uh, we rode around last night looking at them and uh, my wife and I did, and we did not see aphids. So that taught them a lesson. Each ladybug or lady beetle, whatever you want to call it, uh, will eat 50 on average aphids a day. So and they'll hunt the aphids wherever they live. It was a feel-good thing to do. So I want to thank you for watching and joining us today, and I hope that everything's going well with your bees. And there again, if you've got a topic that we haven't touched on that you think would be very important for others to hear, please go to thewaytobee.org and click on the page, The Way to Bee, and submit your topic for consideration. You never know. So thanks for watching. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.